The Story of King Oliver To a number of the followers of jazz in the United States, Great Britain and France, Joseph King Oliver has become as much a kind of a culture hero as he is a source of aesthetic respect. But unlike John Henry's or Stack O'Lee's, Oliver is not the kind of story from which an epic is made, although Oliver the King of New Orleans, moving into conquer Chicago's south side, delighting a public and amazing musicians might promise an epic of a sort. The details are not worked out, nor the emotions refined. Oliver's story is potentially tragedy, and it is an attempt at a tragedy it has often been told. The details are not worked out, nor the emotions refined. Oliver's story is potentially tragedy, and it is in an attempt at tragedy it has often been told. The story was not taken up by folk balladeers or the singers on the race lists, as were other epics and tragedies of jazz music, but by the writers and documentarians of jazz. Specifically in its first history, Jazz Men, the pathetic presence of Joseph Oliver somehow almost pervades that book, and at least it served to objectify the special, nostalgic, somewhat defensive, often sentimental attitudes that characterised the approaches of so many of the continental and American writers on jazz of the period. An even more sugary version of that mythic figure was made the focal point and a central character of Hollywood's first attempt at the movie about the epic of jazz syncopation, obviously inspired by jazz men. Oliver's was, then, the medieval tragedy of success fallen onto bitter days by fate. But fate in this story was not so unknown a force as it had been to Bassaccio. Fate was public caprice, American commercialism, and the boorishness of popular taste. Thus Oliver could be praised by these writers because he set Chicago on its ear and had the public flocking in the early twenties, and then he could be revered because an insensitive and unesthetic public had abandoned him, and had even refused to respond to him when, some would say, he tried to sell out to take that public and the controllers of its taste and formed big bands. The Oliver myth fits neatly in with the others in jazz of the time like the rather Keatsian interpretation of Bix Beiderbecke's life that was already prevalent in the 30s, which captured the tenor of those times so well for a certain segment of Bohemia. Jazz, like left-wing politics and the common man, was a cause, a special kind of emotional, not really either aesthetic or political and the ageing Oliver could supplement the artist cut off in his youth by the crass world story of Bix. Both men in these stories were too perfect and too put upon to be real tragic heroes, and what we got was a crude and sentimental story of the fallen hero in which the public appeared as both the discoverer of artistic talent and the enemy of artistic integrity. Both myths survive today, chiefly in certain more conservative areas of jazz criticism, areas where the Oliver character could be, and has been, supplanted as the hero of the story by Tommy Ladnier, by Joe Smith, by Hot Lips Page, and currently by Cootie Williams and Roy Aldridge. The myth repeats and repeats. The name changes. But in all such accounts, the realities of the individual his responsibilities to his talent, and the facts of the world in which he functions are either ignored or too sentimentally presented to be tragic, and such proto-myths must die as symptoms of a time which commented without perception in terms which the realities of a living music cannot sustain. But Oliver's is indeed a pathetic story. His letters from his last years published in Jazz Men, are among the most moving documents which have been preserved from the past in jazz, and the nobility and adversity which they show could not come from that kind of showbiz delusion which was the source of Jelly Roll Morton's bravura. I receive your card. You don't know how much I appreciate your thinking about the old man. Thank God I only need one thing, and that is clothes. I am not making enough money to buy clothes, as I can't play any more. 
Soon as the weather can fit my clothes, I know I can do better in New York. We are still having nice weather here. The Lord is sure good to me without an overcoat. My heart don't bother me just a little at times, but my breath is still short and I'm not at all fat. Don't think I will ever raise enough money to buy a ticket to New York. I'm not one to give up quick. If I was, I don't know where I would be today. I always feel like I've got a chance. I still feel I'm going to snap out of the rut I've been in for several years. What makes me feel optimistic at times? Looks like every time one door closes on me, another door opens. I'm going to try and save myself a ticket to New York. I open the pool rooms at 9am and close at 12 midnight. If the money was only a quarter as much as the hours, I'd be all set. But at that, I can thank God for what I am getting. And one can only report the awesome fortitude represented by the entries from Paul Barnes' 1934 to 1935 notebooks, which are published in full in the Alan Rust monograph. The figures give each man's wages and dollars and cents. C means the engagement was cancelled. Some examples, 1934, May 9th, Williamson, West Virginia, N, $1.50, May 10th, Norton, Virginia, cancelled. May 11th, Bristol, Tennessee, VA, W, 50 cents. August 2nd, Fulton, Key, Nort. August 4th, Clarksville, Tennessee, a dollar. August 12th, Danville, Kentucky, 75 cents. August 13th, Crab Orchard, Key, 75 cents. October 31, Danville, Virginia, cancelled. November 21st, Huntington, West Virginia, zero. Or the Merry Christmas of December 18th, Ashland, Kentucky, $2.71. December 24th, Charleston, West Virginia, zero. December 25th, Ashland, Kentucky, $5. December 26th, Welts, West Virginia, $4. December 27th, Williamson, West Virginia, N, $4. And what the table does not show, cars and buses broken down, fires which burned instruments, crooked promoters cheating the band, constant problems with personnel, competing groups using Oliver's name, and all the rest of it. And there are things that one can only repeat as rumours. Rumours which persist even today, like the one which has two of Louis Armstrong's sidemen in a southern city while on tour, seeing an old man on a street corner selling what are called snowballs, crushed ice with flavoured syrup recognising him as the one-time King Joseph Oliver and being too overcome to speak to him. Chapter 2 New Orleans Joseph Oliver was born in New Orleans in 1885. His family moved several times, largely within the Garden District of the city. Between that time and the day in 1900 when Oliver's mother died in a house at Nashville and Coliseum Avenue. It was then that Joe Oliver's older sister, Victoria Davis, who had nursed him as a baby, began to look after his welfare, and it was to her that his last letters were addressed in 1938. According to Bunk Johnson, Oliver was first introduced to music about 1899 by a Mr. Kenahan, who formed a brass band among the children in his uptown New Orleans neighborhood, with Oliver playing on a cornet, Buddy Bolden, whom most New Orleans musicians credit with having started it all in jazz, was playing and improvising mostly for dancers and to great public acclaim as early as 1894. This youthful band even toured a bit locally and once got to bat on Rouge, and it was from that trip that Oliver returned with a deep scar over his left eye. An earlier accident, it is said by some, had left that eye blind the details of Oliver's musical career in New Orleans, once he was older and skilled enough to get jobs in the regular brass dance bands of the city, have been variously reported. Indeed, like many men in the city, he probably played in several groups at the same time. For these men were not necessarily professional musicians. Most of them held day jobs and played for parades, funerals and dances as a natural part of a community life. Oliver worked as a butler. 
Perhaps more important than the names of the bands with which Oliver played are the names of some of the men with whom he played in them, for they may give us some indication of what kinds of music these groups made and what they stood for. Thus, the Melrose Brass Band featured trombonist Honoré Dutre, as also did the Magnolia Band. The Eagle Band, which was certainly celebrated in the city, had Frank Dewson, only a legend to most of us. Then, in and out of the Magnolia Band, all reportedly while Oliver was in it, were George Pops Foster Bass, Lorenzo Tio Senior Clarinet, George Backett Clarinet, Johnny Sincere Banjo and Guitar. Besides such community engagements with the brass bands, which also of course would play at evening dances at the many lodges and clubs in the Afro-American community, there were other kinds of jobs. For example, there was a job in the Storyville district at the Abadi Cabaret at Murray and Bienville streets, with a quartet led by pianist-composer Richard M. Jones, which included Lewis Nelson Delisle on clarinet, and Delisle was undoubtedly Jimmy Noon's major inspiration. It was during this engagement that Oliver's reputation rose, for down the street at Pete Layla's cafe played the powerful Freddie Keppard, one of the first kings of New Orleans trumpeters after Bolden, and many thought Oliver was out playing him. Keppard was also the leader of the Olympia Brass Band, but probably most significant was his tour with the original Creole Orchestra beginning in 1911, which took the jazz music of New Orleans to Coney Island, New York and Los Angeles, California. When he left, Armand J. Piron took over the Olympia Band and he used Joseph Oliver on cornet. The group at Pete Layla's then included Sidney Bechet and, at various times, Zoo Robinson on trombone, Lorenzo Tio Jr., teacher of so many, including Barney Bigard and Oma Simeon, on clarinet. Meanwhile, Piron's dance group was playing society jobs and featured the leader's violin. One might conjecture that Oliver's formal knowledge of music grew as he worked for Piron. Oliver also toured at this time through Louisiana, not entirely successfully, and Clarence Williams was a comedian with the group. Clarence Williams was later manager at Layla's in 1914, when the band, which included clarinetist Johnny Dodds and bassist Ed Garland, was led by Kid Ory. Kid Ory replaced his trumpeter with King Oliver and began to bill him in advertising as King, a title which public acclaim alone apparently had earlier awarded to Bolden and Keppard. There were, of course, many changes of personnel in this group. Clarinetists Sidney Bechet, Jimmy Noon and Albert Nicholas were all in and out of it. There were, of course, many changes of personnel in this group. Clarinetists Sidney Bechet, Jimmy Noon and Albert Nicholas were all in and out of it, for example. And it was during this time that the touring and the closing of the Storyville District, 10th of November 1917, all led New Orleans musicians north of Chicago and west to Los Angeles. Early in 1918, bassist Bill Johnson, who had lured Keppard on the tour, sent first for cornetist Buddy Petit, and, when he would not come, for Joe Oliver to play an engagement at the Royal Gardens Cafe in Chicago, Oliver left New Orleans. Chapter 3 it is very difficult for us to reconstruct the music that Oliver heard and absorbed in New Orleans or what its players' intentions were. Difficult in the sense that there were all sorts of popular music played in that city, from the more or less formal French and American folk songs and dances of the Creoles of Colour to the most elementary kind of country blues singing and playing of the Afro-Americans who had migrated to the city from nearby plantations and some of the very same men may have participated in and played all of it. Besides the excellent players it nurtured and its style, perhaps the most essential thing of the New Orleans music which came to be called jazz offered has been described by clarinetist Garvin Bushell in an article by Nat Hentoff, the Jazz Review, January 1959, as feeling and what is now called soul. 
Bushell is admittedly speaking of what he had heard mostly in the 20s, but he does not credit New Orleans so much with a style, except that the men used four beats instead of two, or with making variations, which was featured in some performances of ragtime, or with improvisation, which is, of course, in any blues singing or playing, or in any folk music anywhere. But Bushell does say that in the face of musical and social trends among some Afro-Americans, which constantly led them away from everything supposedly negroid, and into some strange but still understandable snobberies, the New Orleans musicians preserved and spread a transformed, instrumental version of the passionate soul of the blues, and they played it unashamedly. In New Orleans, the music fulfilled the functional role which any such music would in any community. It was for dances, parades, and atmosphere in bars, and in all of these it expressed the feelings of its audience. It is possible, of course, for such communal music to express what its audiences would like to think it felt, but one would not need verbal confirmation to know that New Orleans jazz was too honest an art for that. We have often been invited to see this jazz that evolved. The best exposition of this is probably in Alan Lomax's Mr. Jelly Roll, as a result of the coming together of the more or less formal downtown musics of the proud Creoles of Colour, and the uptown blues and church musics, some of them ex-slaves who had migrated to New Orleans. The Creoles of Colour were the offspring of French and Spanish colonials and of their Afro-American slaves who were sometimes freed and given property and land and even educated abroad. After the Civil War, and as social discrimination and segregation gradually encroached upon New Orleans, their pride tumbled, at least on the surface, and they became part of the larger Afro-American community. A New Orleans instrumental jazz music resulted. Probably the best available to us today of what this combination of formal musical knowledge and European dance rhythms and the spirit and rhythms of the blues may have sounded like in early days can be heard on some of Armand J. Piron's recordings made for Columbia. Those records that Piron made for the Victor Company show only what dullness might have resulted with less of the soul of the blues. There is, in the recorded work of Bunk Johnson, both in his playing and in his recreations of Buddy Bolden's style, of Freddie Capard, of Jimmy Noon, of Jelly Roll Morton, a remarkable common characteristic of style which is undeniable, particularly since some New Orleans players, Louis Armstrong, Johnny Dodds and Sidney Bechet, for example, do not often show it. The approach of Morton and Keppard the variation, according to their records, was formal, chorus by chorus, and developmental in larger patterns. Each variation is based on a single, frequently simple idea, which is thematic in point of departure, continued throughout each chorus, and related both to the preceding and following chorus variations, and, if the player were capable, to a total pattern. Armstrong's variations, Bechet's and Dodd's blues are freer, less formal in conception, and in the style of perhaps of younger men. In a sense, Oliver's playing on records represents, as we shall see, both approaches, and I think they both reflect something which can only be a conjecture. However much improvisation and variation were practiced elsewhere in Afro-American musics, in New Orleans, they had been a cornerstone of the style for a long time, a basic attribute which musicians worked hard to develop in their playing. Chapter 4 Actually, two jobs awaited Oliver when he arrived in Chicago. He played at the Royal Gardens with Bill Johnson's group, who had left New Orleans with him, and drummer Paul Barberin, and he doubled for a while in Lawrence Duke's group at the Dreamland Café along with Roy Palmer on trombone, Sidney Bechet on clarinet, Lil Harden on piano, Wellman Broad on bass, and Minor Hall on drums. Lil Harden described her joining the group. King Oliver and Johnny Dodds came over together that night, and so he said to me he was working at the Royal Gardens, and also said that he'd be very glad if I could come over and work with him. So I told him 
I had to give two weeks notice and it was a thrill to me to think that the great king wanted me to come and play with him. In January 1920, Oliver was leading a band of his own at the Dreamland, and again doubling in a State Street cabaret and gangster hangout from one until six in the morning. In this group were Johnny Dodds, Honore Dutre on trombone, Lil Harden on piano, Ed Garland on bass, and Minor Hall on drums. In 1921, Oliver got a letter from the manager of the Bogola Dance Pavilion in San Francisco. The man had heard Kid Ori's band and wanted him. Ori had another contract and told him about Oliver. It was this Ori band, by the way, which made the first jazz recording by an Afro-American group and gave us the earliest idea of New Orleans jazz that we have. Various changes of personnel, including one which got Johnny Dodd's brother Warren Baby Dodds into it, the Oliver Band played in Los Angeles, where Oliver also played with a large band led by Jelly Roll Morton, which featured three trumpets and a three-man reed section. Oliver later returned to Oakland and soon back to Chicago, despite an assurance of continued success in the Bay Area. About the band, Lil Harden says, Johnny was sober where Baby Dodds was kind of wild. He was kind of the playboy of the orchestra. King Oliver was sober too. He smoked cigars, but he didn't drink. None of them drank hardly, and Dutre, who was a very business sort of a fellow, he was always buying property or something. Back in Chicago, the building at the Lincoln Gardens, the old Royal Gardens renamed, was King Oliver's Creole Jazz Band, and the personnel included Honore Dutre trombone, Johnny Dodd's clarinet, Bertha Gonzulin, and later Lil Harden on piano, Bill Johnson on the bass, and Baby Dodd's drums. In the summer of 1922, a young cornetist named Louis Armstrong received a telegram in New Orleans from King Oliver, who had encouraged him years before, to come to Chicago and join his band on Second Cornet, a role Oliver had played in New Orleans with Manuel Perez, and Buck Johnson had played with Buddy Bolden. It was this band which had the most astonishing local popularity that Oliver had ever seen. It had musicians listening in awe, had many travelling from elsewhere to hear, and which was, in sessions for Janet, OK, Paramount and Columbia Records, to begin the first regular recordings of jazz music. Much has been written about this group from the contemporary write-ups of the Chicago Defender, the reminiscent accounts of its popularity and power by Preston Jackson, and the accounts by George Wetling of how he and other drummers would come nightly to study Baby Dodds. But Louis Armstrong did not make this band. Again, there are the words of Garvin Bushell to Nat Hentoff from the Jazz Review on February 1959. We went on the road with Mamie Smith in 1921. When we got to Chicago, Bubba Miley and I went hearing Oliver at the Dreamland every night. It was the first time I'd heard New Orleans jazz to any advantage, and I studied them every night for the entire week we were in town. I was very much impressed with their blues and their sound. The cornets and clarinets in the East had a better legitimate quality, but their sound touched you more. It was less cultivated, but more impressive of how the people felt. Bubba and I sat there with our mouths wide open. We talked with the Dodds brothers. They felt very highly about what they were playing, as though they knew they were doing something new that nobody else could do. I'd say they did regard themselves as artists in the sense we use the term today. Before I went to Dreamland every night, I'd heard a New Orleans band that played a lot where a carnival was taking place. It was the Thomas New Orleans Jug Band, and it was more primitive than Oliver's. It had the same beat as Oliver's, but what we call in Ohio the shimmy. They played mostly blues, and they played four beat, as did Oliver. After we'd heard Oliver and Dodds, they were our criterion. Here is Lil Harden's account of the attention they were getting at the Lincoln Gardens. While we were playing at the Raw Gardens, a bunch of white musicians, 10, 12, 15, sometimes 20 would come, and they would roll up right in front of the bandstand to listen. Lewis and Joe said they were some of Paul Whiteman's band, that Bix was in the bunch. 
They used to talk to Lewis and King Oliver and Johnny. Several of them would sit in occasionally, but they would listen so intently. King Oliver said to me one night that Lewis could play better than he could. He said, but as long as I got him with me, he won't be able to get ahead of me. I'll still be king. By the spring of 1923, this band had, with some personal changes, a chance to tour and to record. Lil Harden has described their first of several sessions. Then we got the record date. At the first session, we were recording into a big horn then. You know the style. And the band was around the horn, and Lewis was there, right there, as he always was, right next to Joe. It didn't work out. You couldn't hear Joe's playing, so they moved Louis way over in the corner, away from the band. Lewis was standing over there looking so lonesome. He thought it was bad for him to have to be so far away from the band. He was looking so sad, and I'd look at him and smile, you know. That's the only way they could get the balance. Lewis, well, he was at least 12 or 15 feet from us in, on the whole session. Then there were tours the next year on the Keith Orpheum circuit, through Ohio, Wisconsin, Michigan, even Pennsylvania, but now with Zoo Robinson on trombone, then John Lindsay on trombone, Buster Bailey on clarinet, then Albert Nicholas on clarinet, and Rudy Jackson on reeds, Charlie Jackson on bass sax, Bud Scott on banjo, and Snags Jones on drums as replacements in the group. Lil Harden explained it. Johnny Dodds found out that Joe had been collecting $95 for each member of the band while he had been paying a $75. So naturally he had been making $20 a week a piece of all of us. I don't know for how long. So Johnny Dodds and Baby Dodds, they threatened to beat Joe up. So Joe brought a pistol every night to work in his cornet case in case anything happened. Everybody gave in notice except Lewis. Lewis always was so crazy about Joe. You know, he was his idol, so he wouldn't quit. If Lewis didn't quit, so naturally I wouldn't quit. So Lewis and I stayed with Joe. Now that is why you don't find Dutre, Johnny Dodds and Baby Dodds on this Eastern tour with us. He had to replace everybody except Lewis and myself. In the summer of 1924, Lewis Armstrong left Oliver first to play with Ollie Powers at the Dreamland for three months, and then to New York in September to join Fletcher Henderson. Oliver had returned to the Lincoln Gardens in June 1924. It is often said that the next Oliver bands to record, known on records as the Dixie Syncopators or Savannah Syncopators, were, in the use of a reed section and handwritten arrangements, an effort at commercialization. On the other hand, reed sections with saxophones had been in New Orleans groups, and not just the legitimate downtown ones, in the riverboat bands and the Morton bands previously mentioned, and on his earliest band records. In many Chicago groups, in the 1919 group Oliver had led at the Liberty Bond Drive, and in the group Oliver had just taken on tour in 1924, it seems very likely that in that earlier group on the 1924 tour, and in one Oliver now took into the Lincoln Gardens, which at first had Buster Bailey on clarinet and alto sax, Rudy Jackson on tenor saxophone, and, and Charlie Jackson on bass saxophone, some basis for his future styles, however much these styles may have owed to conventional dance bands of the time, and his own past was laid. However, much polyphony was employed and continued to be more conventional. Solo and section work must have been used before the syncopators. Indeed, it had been all along with Oliver's bands. There are such harmonised passages as those on the Creole Jazz Band's version of Chattanooga Stomp, for example, but to call these changes evolutionary and inevitable is not to call them improvements, of course. Business was not good, the personnel changed, the band tried to get outside jobs, and in September 1924, Oliver left the group in charge of Bob Schofner, his second cornet, to go to New York and to try and get a recording contract. He failed, and on his return the gardens were open only three days a week. By late December a redecorated Lincoln Gardens and a revamped Oliver band, but with the same basic instrumentation, was ready to open. In it were Lee Collins, Paul Barberin, and fresh from New Orleans, 
Albert Nicholas and Barney Bigard on reeds and Lewis Russell, but this group never played. On the day it was to open, the gardens caught fire. Oliver, with a band and no place to use it, took a chair as the world's greatest jazz cornetist with Dave Payton's symphonic syncopators at the Plantation Cafe. There he apparently kept his music book stubbornly closed, played his parts by ear, and very soon had arranged an engagement there at the plantation for his own group, perhaps his real objective in the first place. That job lasted two years, and saw such men as Tommy Ladnier and Kidori in a changing personnel. In March 1926, Oliver got a contract to record regularly for the Vocalian Race series. The labels read Electrically Recorded and King Oliver and his Dixie Syncopators. There were some decided hits between 1906 and 1928 in this series. Snagit, Sugarfoot Stomp, Someday Sweetheart, Dead Man Blues, West End Blues. And on such records as these, and not earlier ones, Oliver's natural public reputation and popularity was largely made of course. In March 1927 the plantation was closed, possibly by the police, and just as it was rescheduled to reopen, a fire destroyed it. Oliver took to the road playing at college dances and brief engagements in Milwaukee, Detroit and St. Louis. The band was stranded in St. Louis, but by May 1927, headlines and the Chicago Defender announced the band's arrival in New York with King Oliver Made Good at Savoy. In 1927, as in every year until the late 1940s, the Savoy Ballroom was a testing ground for any Afro-American orchestra. Oliver was there for two weeks and was hardly a failure, although such an engagement probably does not warrant so blatant a claim as the defenders King Oliver Takes New York by Storm. The men had arrived by the cheapest and slowest trains, just in time to go directly onto the bandstand still tired and dirty from a long trip. One night engagements in the New York City, New Jersey area followed, and then came what turned out to be opportunity knocking. A new nightclub called the Cotton Club was to open, and Oliver's band was offered the job of providing the house band for dancing, floor shows, and, as it turned out, a radio wire which would spread the music across the United States. Oliver, again proud and stubborn, decided his name and his orchestra were worth more money than the club was offering, and he refused the offer. The job went to a young man from Washington, D.C., named Duke Ellington, who stayed for three years. Oliver played briefly in some major cities in the East, Philadelphia, Washington, and Baltimore, but soon his men had drifted away except for a nucleus of three or four musicians. For three years Oliver had no band, or, as one musician put it, the only band, office or engagements he had were in his hat. He did keep his recording dates up for the Vocalian Brunswick label, to be sure, but by the end of 1928 was using Lewis Russell's band or Elmer Snowden's as his own for recordings, or simply picking up the best men he could find. At the same time Oliver was recording on his own, with various Clarence Williams groups. In late 1928, Oliver had, through the efforts of Agent Harrison Smith, a new recording contract and a $1,000 advance, and one that most band leaders would have envied him for. It was with the Victor label, a large and powerful company then as now. But Jimmy O'Keefe at Vocali in Brunswick had largely let Oliver have his own way with his own records. Victor, he soon learned, was not so liberal towards him. Another characteristic of the Victor series is that, although there are many trumpet solos by Oliver, there are also many by other trumpeters, and that a great deal of the work in assembling and organising the bands, and much of the composing and arranging, was done by Oliver's nephew, trumpeter Dave Nelson. The Victor contract kept him going, but Oliver did a few jobs in the New York area, and there was a tour into the Midwest in 1930. On it, Oliver refused to play his Victor repertoire. The group was stranded in Kansas City, and Oliver was taken ill in Wichita, Kansas for three months. 
but he had still refused jobs in Chicago and New Orleans because he did not like the terms offered. Louis Armstrong and Earl Hines accepted two of those jobs. By the end of 1930, Oliver was in New York, the Victor contract was up, the band had broken up, and Dave Nelson left with many arrangements which he had made but had not been paid for. Chapter 5, Seven Years on the Road But the next year Oliver had a new band, composed of younger men, and went off on a tour of the South and Southwest. One might say that Oliver spent the rest of his life making this tour. In the beginning it was a comparatively good tour, but soon salaries were being cut and musicians were leaving. Joseph Oliver had apparently been one of those who were born an old man, as some men do. He conducted himself as though he were at least middle-aged nearly all of his life. Pianist Don Kirkpatrick has spoken of how he sat almost sullenly in front of his band when it opened at the Savoy, with soft slippers on his feet, speaking shortly and gruffly to his men, and stood only for his own solos. But by now he was prematurely ageing in more than conduct. He had pyorrhea, his gums bled, and his teeth were coming out. And if that story about Oliver's keeping a bucket of sugar water for the band to drink from at the Lincoln Gardens is true, little wonder that they did. Therefore, he could play less and less, and he had heart trouble and frequent colds. It was during this period, this seven-year tour of the South and Southwest, confounded by the Depression, that the letters and the logbook we have quoted above were written. Personnel changed, cars and buses broke down, engagements were broken, jobs were played without pay, and fires destroyed equipment. But always Oliver managed to keep up a front, a public one that meant keeping uniforms neat and clean, and a private one that he would get back to New York or a new door would open soon. But the realities of life included the night the bus broke down in the West Virginian mountains, and to keep warm, the men had to burn the tyres and the fleeting encouragement of a radio wire at one engagement. The band could play over, but their singer Rudy MacDonald couldn't use it. Such are the strange ways of Jim Crow. By 1935, Oliver could no longer play, but the touring, such as it was, continued. In 1936, his headquarters were in Savannah. He didn't have enough clothes, and he was ill. Again, there was still some touring, but in his last year he ran a fruit stand and later worked 15 hours a day as janitor in a pool hall. On Friday the 8th of April 1938, Joseph King Oliver died of cerebral hemorrhage. His sister spent her rent money to have his body brought to New York. On 12th of April, Louis Armstrong, Clarence Williams and a loyal group of musician friends saw him buried at Woodlawn Cemetery, the Bronx, New York. There was no headstone on his grave, although in subsequent years funds were raised and now there is a headstone.